Our first speaker for this session is William G. Thomas. He's an amateur historian, a professional soldier retired, and a formerly trained librarian who is the photo archivist at Pikes Peak Library District Special Collections. Fabulous, fabulous collection. He earned a BS in political science from the University of Maryland, a BA in history from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and an MS in library science and information studies from Florida State University. William. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. On Friday, November 9, 1894, the front page of the Colorado Springs Gazette loudly proclaimed the joyous events of the evening before. Jubilee, Colorado Springs went wild last evening, celebrating election. For once, the city's invalids were forgotten. And that's really an important statement if you think about it. <laughs> Whistles and fireworks, a torchlight procession with floats and transparencies, and I think I like this one the best. The tuneful Gazette whistle was heard once more. Apparently, the Gazette whistle had been very, very sad for about two years, but was feeling a lot better. The Colorado Springs Evening Telegraph, the other major daily, picked up on the theme. Everybody in it, big jollification, a big torchlight parade, big bonfires burned, fireworks were shot off, every steam whistle blew, every boy had a horn, every band played, every dog barked. <laughs> and most importantly, the Honorable Irving Halbert was given a vociferous salute. And of course, the reason for this celebration was the defeat of populist Governor Davis H. Waite. Many citizens of El Paso County, especially the business community, the mine owners, the bankers, the more conservative political leaders, and most especially, most especially, William Platt, the editor and publisher of the Gazette, felt a special animus for this controversial governor. They hated him, hated him. And the wild celebration that night reflected their relief and their joy. In their view, in their view, things would finally get back to normal and this ill-conceived two-year socialist experiment had finally come to an end. Now, to better understand why they were so happy that night, we need to take a quick look at Governor Waite and his administration. Davis Hanson Waite was, was elected governor in 1892. He had sympathy for the plight of laborers, for farmers, and for miners. He believed they should organize to improve their lives, and he wanted to help them do just that. Waite was the chief spokesman for the populist viewpoint in Colorado, and he was fearless. He attacked the railroads, suggesting they control much of Colorado politics. He attacked the monopoly of land control. He condemned government land grants to railroads because they sold the land to large corporations for huge profits. He attacked the United States Senate, suggesting it was largely comprised of lawyers in the pay of Wall Street. <laughs> Some things never change. He called for a graduated income tax. He advocated an eight-hour day for labor. He supported the referendum and the initiative. He called for the use of the secret ballot. He called for the direct election of United States senators, and most importantly for the state of Colorado. He called for the free and unlimited coinage of silver at a rate of 16 to one. At his core, at his core, his very being, Governor White believed the state had a responsibility to use its power to help the oppressed. Now, those views may not seem so unreasonable to some of us today, but in 1894, this was pretty radical stuff. So you, wouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised to learn that the conservative moneyed classes, of, moneyed classes of Colorado both hated and feared Governor Waite. However, Governor Waite's administration would play, was plagued with problems from day one. And unfortunately for the populace, he made some serious missteps along the way. His biggest challenge, of course, was the Panic of 93, which was a national depression that would last for years 
and hit Colorado, hit Colorado particularly hard because of the silver issue. And Governor Waite's responses to these problems were ineffective at best and inspired contempt on the part of many of his political opponents. There are several other memorable aspects of Governor Waite's um, tenure, and I'll you know, just talk about them real briefly. You probably all know the story, but you might appreciate just a little refresher. Um, first was the bloody bridal speech. In a speech given on July 11, 1893, Governor Wade outraged, outraged many in the state and across the country by threatening war and revolution, blaming the outside forces for the state's problems. And he was probably right about that. And to quote the governor, it is better infinitely that blood should flow to the horses' bridles rather than our liberties be destroyed. The war has begun. It is the same war which must always be waged against oppression and tyranny to preserve the liberties of men. <laughs> of course, the Gazette heard about this speech, and their response was kind of fun. They called him an irresponsible, raving, weak-minded man in his dotage, deserving only the severest censure and the sternest condemnation. His insane and revolutionary address will no doubt convince many people in the East that the people of Colorado are crazy <laughs> and their opinion worth less than nothing. Next came the governor's Fandango dollar scheme. As a way of making up for lost silver revenue, Governor Waite proposed shipping all of Colorado's silver to Mexico where it would be coined and minted and then brought back to Colorado where it would be adopted as legal tender. That was the plan um, and this caught fire and spread across the country really fast and the very next day, think about it, the very next day the Treasury Department issued a statement saying that Governor Waite's plan was unconstitutional, that he knew it was unconstitutional, and if he went ahead with it, the federal government would intervene in the affairs of Colorado. Undeterred, undeterred, <laughs> in January, he called the legislature into special session and asked them to act on his proposal. They decided that was not a wise course. So that was the end of the Fandango dollar scheme. Next came the Denver City Hall War. This was the time before home rule, so the state of Colorado controlled the administration of Denver. Uh, Governor Waite saw some corruption, and he was probably right about this, saw some corruption in the administration of Denver and decided to fire two officials. Well, the problem was those officials would not be fired. They barricaded themselves in City Hall. Okay. And 110 policemen joined them, armed with weapons and dynamite, and issued a challenge to the governor. Come on, we're not leaving. Come and get us. Well, the governor said, OK. He called out the militia. All right, so you have this bizarre scene in Denver where the militia is surrounding City Hall, preparing to assault City Hall with cannon. And you have thousands of Denver citizens on the street wondering if war is going to break out today or not. Well, in the end, the governor saw better, called back the militia, and allowed the courts to handle it, which is what he should have did in the, in the first place, because the courts sided with the governor. But people are beginning to think a little bit about the governor. It's hurting his reputation. Um, the last you know about this is the, the Cripple Creek crisis. This is the first Cripple Creek crisis. Recall that in 1894, things are really getting out of control. They're escalating in Cripple Creek. On June 2nd, Governor Waite, his private secretary, and Union President John Calderwood came into Colorado Springs to meet with the mine owners to try to resolve the situation in Cripple Creek. It's a really interesting story, and if you haven't read it, you should. Um, but the bottom line is the citizens, some of the law and order citizens of Colorado Springs, realized the governor was in town. They formed a mob, an angry armed mob, moved up to Colorado colleges where they were meeting and threatened to lynch the party, the governor and his union president and his private secretary. They escaped out of the back door, hustled down to the train, and they were gone. But imagine that. Imagine something like that happening today here. It was, the administration was, you know, it was tough. So you can probably see why some of the more influential and conservative citizens of Colorado were absolutely determined to do everything they could within their power to unseat the governor. 
and they gave the job to a man they trusted, Irving Halbert of Colorado Springs. Irving Howard was well-known and well-respected within the conservative power circles of the state. Our view of Howard today, I think, is much more mixed and disputed than it was when he lived. Um, people understood him then at that time. But a, little, a quick bio, he was at Sand Creek, you all know that, and he defended the actions of Sand Creek until his dying day. He was the El Paso County Clerk for nearly 10 years. He was a wealthy mine owner, a successful banker, a railroad builder, he was a state senator, and he was often urged to run for governor when winning the nomination was tantamount to winning the election, and he declined every time. Immediately after being given control of the campaign, Halbert sought advice from the smartest political minds in the state, and he did not like what he heard. Senator Teller, an old friend and confidant of Halbert, expressed his view of the situation, and he had serious doubts about the chances of the Republican victory in November. Wade had strong support from the unions. The farmers and laborers were on his side, and he had all the power of patronage and that comes with incumbency, and he was willing to use that power to win votes. Halbert, however, recognized something that Teller and perhaps several others didn't see. This was the first gubernator gubernatorial election where women were going to be involved. Women, women had won the vote in 1893. This was 1894. If women, women's votes were to be won, Halbert reasoned, their concern should be given voice in every phase of the campaign, and the most effective way to do this would be to give women leadership roles in party management and campaign decisions at every level from the state to the precincts to the wards. Women participated in every event from caucuses to conventions, and a woman delegate was chosen from nearly every precinct in the state. However, Halbert also understood that he needed more than just good organization to win the election. He needed a powerful and compelling message to inspire voters to turn out in the first place. He turned to Judith Ellen Foster for help. She was a lawyer from Iowa, and she was described as the most powerful Republican woman speaker in the country. Foster spent six months in Colorado traveling across the state, giving speeches, and she didn't leave until the election was over. She spoke with strength and passion, defining woman's place in the world and the high character of her mission. She appealed, very importantly, she appealed to Christian virtue, decrying the behavior and language of Governor Waite. The governor cussed a little bit, and, and it was a problem. Um, she condemned the populace for its Sabbath breaking, and she expressed her strong disapproval of the populace for disregarding all things patriotic and sacred. So you begin to see the themes here. Christian virtue, Sabbath, patriotism, sacredness. Women have a special place in the world and with their higher character and their higher understanding comes a special mission. If you're a woman voting for the first time, especially if you're a young woman voting for the first time, this is very powerful stuff. Well, as you can imagine, the Republicans soundly defeated the populace in 94. Albert McIntyre, the Republican candidate for governor, won the election by more than 20,000 votes. And his victory, his margin of victory was five times more than Waits in 92. This was quite an impressive victory when you think about all the challenges that Halbert had to face, especially when you realize that women got the vote in 1893 under populist leadership, under populist leadership, and the populace expected the women's vote because of it. So how, how did Halbert pull this off? Well, organizing for victory, of course, was an important first step, and he did that very well. But the message was the critical part of it, and this is the message, so please pay attention to this. Halbert and the Republicans, with strong support from the business community, the mine owners, the bankers, the land managers, and some very conservative newspapers, like the Colorado Springs Gazette, created the perception in the minds of all the voters, but especially in the minds of the women voters, that Colorado was rapidly descending into a state of lawlessness, anarchy, and instability 
brought about by Governor Waite, the populace and their crazy socialist ideas. Just look around, they said. The state economy was in depression. Unemployment had skyrocketed. Real estate values had plummeted. Governor Waite's militia confronted the police in Denver. Governor Waite's militia stopped the El Paso County Sheriff from doing his duties in Cripple Creek. And things had gotten so bad that the federal government had even threatened to intervene in Colorado's internal affairs. The state simply couldn't survive two more years of Governor Waite. Law and order and stability had to be restored. This was the basic message that Halbert and his allies hammered home again and again and again. And all this, although this basic message was compelling, it wasn't enough. The more important element of the overall message was specifically tailored to appeal to the women of Colorado. And this was the message of Christian virtue that J. Ellen Foster carried across the state for the entire six months. Her task was to convince the women voters that it was their responsibility, their sacred responsibility, to return Colorado to a state of good government, law and order, and stability, and Foster did her job well. She did it very well. But even now, having said all that, I think the question before the House still remains. Did the women of Colorado reject populism or not? And it seems to me that the best place to turn to for the answers to this question would be the people who were actually in the arena themselves, the people who fought. Governor Waite had no doubts about the question, and I'm quoting the governor now. Conservative forces had corruptly used <clears throat> ignorant women to overthrow populism. <laughs> These girls neither knew or cared how they voted. The right of suffrage should be based on intelligence. <laughs> Quoting the governor, female suffrage, I hope, will hereafter be opposed by all populists. <laughs> Lots of anger there. Celia Waite, his wife, who knew him better than anyone else, was equally clear on the issue. In an interview with a reporter from the Denver Times Sun on November 13th, only a week after the election, she said, and I quote, I'm quoting the first lady here, I never was so disgusted with anything in my life as I am with the results of the equal suffrage movement. I favored it before it passed the legislature and worked for it all I could, and it was due entirely, due entirely to the efforts of the populist party that they were given the ballot at all. They have simply gone and cut the throat of the party which gave them the right to vote and have, I'm quoting the first lady here, have disgraced their womanhood. The governor also opposes the enfranchisement of women as much as I do now. And if he had his own way, they would never get it again. <laughs> Clearly the whites felt angry and very betrayed. Um, I think the last word on the topic should go to, go to Irving Halbert himself. On November 20th, at a victory banquet given in his honor at the Antlers Hotel, this modest, it's soft-spoken gentleman gave perhaps the most important speech of his life. He was very gracious in his praise of all those who supported his work during the campaign. But he saved his highest praise for the women of Colorado. Their intelligence, their earnestness, and their activity were irresistible. All honor goes to the women of Colorado for their support. They were the key. They were the key to this splendid victory. Thank you. You just love history. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks, William. Our next speaker is Aaron Barnes. Aaron earned both a BS and MA in history from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She currently serves as Special Collections Specialist at the 1905 Carnegie Library in downtown Colorado Springs. Her primary research interest centers on American Indians and the 20th century. Having grandparents on the tribal roles of the Colville Confederated Tribes, she hopes to continue the family heritage through historical scholarship. 
Erin. Thank you. This morning, I want to present a more unusual, perhaps, benefactor of our city, the American Indian, and hopefully shed some light on our city's relationship with American Indians in the early years of the 20th century. So our unwitting benefactors, American Indians, and tourism in our region. In December of 1911, the fledgling Indian rights group, the Society of American Indians, are searching for a location for their next national conference. A veritable who's who of America's most successful, assimilated, and accomplished American Indians. Colorado Springs had generously offered themselves as the ideal location for such convention, but their president, Sherman Coolidge, who was a full-blooded Arapaho and uh, Episcopalian minister, was not so sure. He wrote, quote, I was in favor of Colorado Springs, but, th but the suggestion to have tents at some small park in the foothills set aside for us by the city did not appeal to me. Feathers and paint and tomahawk may amuse the pale face, and hence the freak Indian or Injun must be put on exhibition. I don't quite relish the idea of being used as an advertisement for the summer resort or for drawing a crowd for a fair. If we have tents, the pale face will at once call it the Indian camp. Heap no good. <laughs> Which he did later become a resident of Colorado Springs, but this is prior to when he moved here. But with his tongue-in-cheek sarcasm, Reverend Coolidge identifies Colorado Springs' reputation as both a thriving resort town and a show place for the American Indian. His comments highlight the dynamic I want to present to you today. Following a conspicuous and purposeful absence of American Indians from this region, they were invited to return to the Pikes Peak region, not as residents or even casual guests, but as objects of exhibition. Intended to boost the region's tourist appeal, becoming, in a sense, our region's unwitting benefactors. It was a conflicted relationship with American Indians and calls us to examine this dynamic on both sides. Recall that our region had been home to numerous Aboriginal tribes, vibrant with culture and heritage specifically tied to this place. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Ute. Of course, we know the gold rush brought the same bloody end and uh, removal process to these Native Americans. Uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho were relocated to Oklahoma by 1869 and Montana, I should add. And by the close of 1882, Utes were removed to Southern Colorado uh, Reservation, as well as parts of Utah. White residents felt justified of Indian removal, for they had endured in their minds years of tumultuous relationships, violence. The Indian represented times of terror, untamed wilderness. He threatened their very way of life. But as time and distance from the Indian troubles lengthened, Americans across the nation became increasingly fascinated with the, ex with the exhibition of America's so-called dying race. Pikes Peak Regional Boosters recognized a new angle with which to draw curious tourists, and Colorado's original inhabitants were invited back to draw both dollar and people with them. The Flower Carnival, also known as the Sunflower Day, provides our first glimpse of this kind of uh, event. Beginning in 1893 as just a parade of carriages with flowers, it was such a success that the city expanded it to a week-long festival. And in 1894, the first group of Ute Indians were invited to participate. This is a mere 12 years following their final removal. Yet their presence promised the draw of a genuine, exotic carnival experience. Plain host to the Ute encampment was, encampment was the Broadmoor Casino, they'll come up there, which eagerly advertised the Indian presence in the newspaper, exclaiming their exhibition for 12 hours a day. Notice also this image in the upper right hand corner of this ad. The Indian has seized a white man with a knife in hand. He appears ready to scalp him. Often in these scenarios, uh, these events, American Indians were expected to reenact their perceived role as violent, bloodthirsty savages. This play acting allowed the region's residents to both relive and even reimagine the glory of conquering the West. Among this first group of Ute Indians were two rather well-known men, 
Chief Severo and Buckskin Charlie, both of them from uh, the Southern Reservation. Uh, Buckskin Charlie would become a regular fixture at these exhibit type events. He was in Denver, he was in Boulder, also of course several times in Colorado Springs. Uh, the week's festivities opened with a parade in which the Utes rode on horses and waved and uh, rode on floats the same evening at the casino. Over 1,000 spectators crowded onto balconies, doorways, windows, and porches to see the Utes perform both the dog dance and a war dance. And of course, a Wild West show closed out the week's festivities and featured nothing less than a mock scalping of the carnival judges. The Gazette took great pains to assure readers that these were, quote, the best dressed, the best looking, the best mannered, and the cleanest of the organizers' pets. It is this very tension that I want to call your attention to. It pervades these tourist draws. The Indian must be clean, respectable, well-mannered. Yet, there also must be a degree of sanitized danger, uh, exotic wildness. As the article declares, they were quite all that our fancy directs them to be. And goes on to say that every visitor seemed to think it necessary to treat them like the elephant at the circus. They were the center of continual showers of fruit, tobacco, and various refreshments. Ultimately, this is what organizers desired of visiting Utes, that these Indians would reenact the fancies of Americans. They were to be wild, exotic showpieces, reenacting the struggle against the wild continent. These, this photograph was taken in 1894 by local photographer H.S. Poley and illustrates this dynamic well. It's obviously staged. Um, you can even see she's smiling in the corner. Uh, and this one, another great example, is so even more kind of aggressive, showing the Utes looking as though they're about to execute this man who is helpless on the ground. But these photographs are a great example of kind of what people were wanting to see. The Flower Carnival had its last hurrah in 1899. Other events like the Pike Centennial Celebration of 1906 were held in intervening years, some with Indians, some with not. But the true successor of the Flower Carnival was the festival Shankiv or Shankivi. I've heard it both ways. Some of you might be more expert than I in how you say that. But it began in 1911. Overland Monthly Magazine called Sean Keeve, quote, the spontaneous outburst of glorious, healthy life in the Pikes Peak region, where the rapidly disappearing Ute Indians fit properly. And that's a quote. That's not my words. <laughs> Tradition held that Sean Keeve was the Ute Indian word for carnival and became the premier summer event of the Pikes Peak region for many years. We have both the cowboy and the Indian at Sean Keeve. Never mind the fact that Colorado Springs had never really been much of a wild western town. It was little London after all. But one editorial expressed it well, saying, quote, This subject is full of romance. And since there is no necessity of sticking rigidly to historic truth, there is splendid opportunity for working up a legend. And, as a, and a legend it became in our city. It was very popular. Uh, in 1912, the city planned three days of dancing, music, pageantry, and of course, the Indians of yesteryear. Over 75 Ute Indians came, led again by Buckskin Charlie, and were slated to walk in parades, perform various dances at Garden of the Gods, like this picture here, and ceremonial de ceremonially dedicate the Ute Trail. Their encampment was located in the Monument Valley Park, where they were mobbed almost constantly by visitors. Their performance of the sun dance in the Garden of the Gods, let me go back so you can look at that. This is the, the sun dance up on, I don't know if you can see that cliff, but they're way up high on the cliff on a platform, was a huge hit. Uh, the paper claimed over 10,000 people came to see the moon dance that same evening, of course, under a full moon in Monument Valley Park. It was a spectacular week for Colorado Springs, and surprisingly there is a great degree of respect towards the youths who were visiting. Yet, the nostalgia and veiled respect was also couched in an underlying attitude from this poster for Sean Keeve for 1912. Notice the image of the Indian here, especially compared with the kind of cool cowboy on the side. He appears childlike, almost delirious with laughter. The small weapon hints at his potential for violence. 
The Sean Keeve exhibition at, the, at its heart proclaimed the American Indian as a childish wildling prominently displayed for our amusement. His music, and this is in the words of the paper, were quote, weird, his dancing peculiar and jerky. Though popular with Sean Keeve attendees, the American Indian was here on display as quote, the freak engine, in the words of our Sherman Coolidge in the beginning. A citywide competition produced this poster the following year in 1913, and we see a, a departure kind of from the attitude that we just saw the year before. The Indian is depicted in a much more realistic manner. There's a village, of course we have Pikes Peak, but certainly they are the focal point of the poster and arguably the focal point for the festival. Organizers counted on the draw that real live Indians would be to tourists across the country. As one local reporter said, everybody is interested in Indians. Everybody likes to watch them, even if they're merely walking about the streets. Yet the, these same accounts also tended towards pity and nostalgia for the American Indian, at once recognizing their unjust situation while seemingly to shrug off any real responsibility or need for action. As one Gazette reporter put it, quote, the Indian's tragedy was to be the white man's entertainment. And this statement gets to the very heart of the tension we are examining today. The region's residents, like most Americans, readily recognize this tragedy. Yet their relationship to the American Indian remained at arm's length. Inviting them back only for entertainment, to harness the allure of the exotic, to capitalize on a thriving tourist industry, to remember the past at a comfortable and entertaining distance. 1913 was the last year in which Ute Indians attended. Rising costs made it difficult for organizers to bring them. Uh, in addition, the BIA was increasingly frowning upon such treats, as they called it, for the Indians, uh, preferring to keep them on the reservation. It was a blow to the future success of the event. Um, over the next years, the event kind of decreases in its scope and its magnitude down to one night, uh, and most of those celebrations up through 1922 were a masked ball kind of celebration with no American Indians in attendance. So we've briefly, very briefly, there's so much to it that we could say, <laughs> briefly examined the white perspective, uh, the region's white residents and tourists to these exhibits. But I was also curious, what can we say about the Indian involvement in these events? Because obviously, they were invited and they came as well and danced and participated. What should we make of their participation? Why accept invitations to participate in events that were often one-dimensional, derogatory portrayals of American Indians? Why be in such spectacles, such as mock scalpings in particular, where Indians are asserted to be violent, aggressive bullies? Of course, the record of Ute response to these things is virtually non-existent, um, at least in the records that I could find. But I believe it's equally important that we consider their side of the story and their involvement. I think it would be a great disservice to paint them as merely victims in the situation. In the time period that we, we have talked about is, uh, I would argue, a just as perilous and dehumanizing period as the Indian Wars for the American Indian in this country. Um, most American Indians are facing extreme poverty. They are facing the removal of their children, the suppression of both culture and religion in this time period. It is a very, very difficult time. In addition, Indians were not allowed to leave the reservation without escort. So here in Colorado, a great example of kind of what's happening is the federal government severely curtailed annuity payments that had been promised to the Ute Indians in an effort to make them assimilate faster, in essence saying, if we don't give you the money, then you won't have access to do the things that you want to do with it. You have to buy our supplies on credit, et cetera. We could get into all the details. But it was a very difficult time for the Ute Indian between 1890 and 1920. So these uh, events like Sean Keeve, Flower Carnival, and other things that they attended were an opportunity for the American Indian. It was an opportunity to travel off the reservation, a temporary reprieve from hardship, and a chance to earn a bit of income. While attending these events, organizers generously fed and uh, provided for uh, these American Indians. Um, 
Many Indians would charge a nickel for a photograph or a peek at their papoose. Though it seemed to offend journalists, I found a lot of outrage in the newspaper that they dared to charge money to be photographed. Uh, many tourists were more than happy to pay a nickel to see something they had never seen before. And this was income that the government couldn't touch, couldn't use, and couldn't prevent them from using. These trips also provided a small opportunity for cultural uh, teaching opportunities for the next generation. There's a lot of accounts of Buckskin Charlie instructing uh, young people in the you know, history of the region and some of their experiences here. But I believe there's one other important reason that Ute Indians agreed to perform, quote unquote. I would argue that in the face of a culture that was convinced that they were a dying breed, a race passing into oblivion, the Ute Indian presence declared, I am here, I remain, we have not disappeared. In the face of cultural anni annihilation, I would argue that sometimes the act of showing up, of pre presenting yourself, presenting your culture, is in, in itself a powerful act of agency. In a nation that erased or marginalized American Indian history and experiences, these, quote, show Indians proved they could be visible and desirable in a culture that invested in their vanishing. I would also argue that participation in these staged productions provided a degree of anonymity to, to American Indians. They could hide behind the screen of these stereotypical expectations. They need only present themselves as the white ideal of the Indian thus shielding themselves from a more personal, intrusive scrutiny. These are seemingly contradictory desires to be both visible in a nation that had written their obituary and hidden from further violence in the face of overwhelming ignorance. Nonetheless, these twin tensions coalesce around the liminal space of visual spectacle of play acting and exhibition. This active ex uh, ex uh, sorry, exhibit, performance, and reenactments by American Indians tapered off in the mid-20s and into the 30s. By the late 1940s and into the 1970s, American Indian presence in the Pikes Peak region began to change from an active live presence to a more representational imagery. Rather than a physical presence, American Indians appear as symbolic monikers, theaters, restaurants, motels all appearing under Indian names, the Ute and Chief Theater, the Indian Grill, um, on and on, the Cheyenne Building. You guys could probably think of lots of them in our area. It is a more detached and caricatured kind of relationship, kind of the idea that they passed away with the Old West only to be seen in pictures. There are, of course, some examples in this period uh, of Indians returning and dancing at Cliff Dwellings, Garden of the Gods, but for the most part, this is mostly what we see. This appropriation of the American Indian and his image sought the same ends, the draw of the American tourist and his dollars. This arm's length relationship of the early 20th century continued. The American Indian maintained their role as our unwitting benefactors in the Pikes Peak region drawing residents and tourists alike to reinvent the violent past and revel instead in a mythic Wild West. <laughs>